My name is Larry Adams. I am a vice chair of the People's Organization for Progress. I'll be serving as a chair for this after this morning. What are we? Still in the morning. This morning's this morning session. And I want to congratulate and thank all of you for coming. This is a People's Conference on the Fight for Jobs, Peace, Equality, and Justice. Give yourselves a hand for taking time out for such an important discussion. Um, overview? No. Yes, overview. Take your bring, every, hope everyone has a, um, a packet, participants, a conference packet. Draw your attention to the agenda. The morning session, we'll have an informative, inspirational presentation from our three panelists who will be introduced uh, in a minute. We will have discussions and uh, of proposed resolutions that have been solicited and submitted from the uh, participants in the 381-day campaign that was initiated by POP. Uh, on, on the, for the, please, Doug, because that takes me right to the next point. Our agenda is very tight. We don't have a lot of time. We're already behind. And what we rely upon, and, and it's not going to be a whole lot of strict rules, so what we rely upon is the consciousness of you and your discipline. For discussion, there's going to be limits to two minutes of, of talk. There will be timekeepers who will show you at one minute a yellow warning and at the second minute a red stop. It's not I'm thinking about it, it's stop. Only because there's a lot we want to do. We've tried to organize it in a way that we could get it in, and we, re we rely on everybody's discipline. Um, in the afternoon, after lunch, we'll have small group discussions that will be about how we're going to implement the people's agenda or the beginning of an agenda that you will have voted on and, and agreed upon in the morning. Then we'll break out into implementation committees and we'll talk about continuations of this activity. Um, I'd like to bring up our welcomers today. Sister Barbara Foley, who is, hey. represents the university and New Jersey now. We've been very instrumental in success in getting this as far as we have. All right. Good morning. Good morning. All right. One more time. Good morning. Good morning. All right. Okay. We're going to have a great conference. Uh, I've been warned to be disciplined and to try to shave off even from my five minutes. Um, so I'll try. Okay. Uh, I, I teach in the English department here and uh, American Studies. I've been here since 1988. Um, I'm a member of Now New Jersey, have been also a member of that, I think, since 1989. I'm, I'm, on, I'm the chair of the Task Force on Combating Racism. Uh, I'm also a member of the People's Organization for Progress. Uh, first of all, I want to give a shout out to people from Rutgers who helped sponsor this event. Okay, and I'm not going to ask individuals to stand because I'm trying to save some time. English department, of which I'm a member, political science, they all kicked in some money, which is good. Helped to pay for the lunches, by the way. American studies, uh, African American and African studies, women and gender studies, urban education, social work. And I'm just very proud that so many people on this campus recognize the importance of this event. Uh, also, the Students' Social Justice Club, which is a very valuable formation here. And then just some students of mine, uh, I must say I gave an extra credit assignment, uh, <laughs> suggesting that people connect uh, what's going on at the conference with some books that we've been reading. Uh, but I really want to welcome all the students who are here because, as I said, in a cliched way, but it's nonetheless true, you are the future. Okay, real quickly, what are, uh, some reflections on this event, uh, where, it's, where it's coming from, where I'm coming from, very briefly. Uh, in being here and what I'd like to see come out of it. Um, I've, been, I've been a movement activist in one way or another since uh, 1969, so you can sort of do the math. I was the last year in college. And um, I've been an activist of one form or another ever since, so that unabashedly I would say that in my view what we're up against is the system of capitalism which is coming down on all of us like, like a ton of bricks. 
And I think it's important to realize that it's, it's not just the air that we breathe. It's a system that's come into being in history. And at some point, I hope, can, can go out of being in history. We need to transcend it. The question is, how do we get there? What are we trying to accomplish uh, at this meeting and a meeting like, th like, like this? Uh, two years ago, some of you know, there was this, all the, the, the Occupy movement was in full flower, and people were talking about the 99% versus the 1%. And there may have been some sort of naive problems with that slogan, but I really like it in a lot of ways because it says we all have a whole lot in common with one another and the people with whom we don't have a lot in common are a very small group of people. That said, it's my experience as a movement activist for many time, over many years, that we really need to be explicitly against sexism, explicitly against racism, because otherwise the unity that we have in our ranks as the 99% is not going to be nearly as solid and strong as it needs to be. Um, another thing that I've been thinking about since the late 60s is how do you, how do you pull together the desire for a fundamental transformation of society with what, it needs to, what needs to be done in the here and now. And there are going to be people here, who, some of whom believe in electoral politics, some believe in mass movements. Uh, things like the boosting the minimum wage in the state of New Jersey is, is a small thing, but it's really important for a lot of people. So I think we have to take that kind of demand seriously, the much bigger demand of jobs for all we need to take seriously. Lots and lots of the issues that are brought up in this in these series of resolutions that, that come before us are of vital importance and they're sort of you know in between full social transformation and what needs to happen now. Uh, so then I, I hope that we have a great day. Uh, we're gonna, I think that this times when we break down in our, in our sessions are gonna be really valuable. I'm hopeful that, okay, two things come out of this conference. One is that the different organizations that we belong to can learn, f find ways to collaborate that are more than just verbal, okay? We really need a coalition of power trans powerful and transformative institutions and organizations in the state in order just to push back the tremendous attack that's coming down on us and then to move us forward. And then I'm hopeful too that one-on-one uh, -on -one ties between and among people can be formed through these discussions because I think organizations just sort of working together as one thing and people working together uh, is another. So that said, I hope I haven't taken more than my five minutes. I, I, I'm very, very honored to welcome you all to Rutgers Newark and I know we're gonna have a great day together. So thank you all for coming. Barbara is our in-plant support. If you have any issues with the physical plant, see Barbara. Important housekeeping. The restrooms are right out the hall to the left, down the end of the hall. <laughs> Important information. Um, my honor to introduce second welcomer, chairman of the People's Organization for Progress, Lawrence Hamm. Good morning. Good morning. Power to the people. Very glad to be here this morning. First of all, I want us to all give a salute and warm round of applause to the planning committee that has been meeting diligently for more than a year to make this happen. Give them a big hand. And in particular, our conference conveners, uh, let me mention the actual conference chair I saw in here. She must know I was going to mention her name and went out. Ingrid Hill, give her a big hand. There she is. Is that, is that Ingrid back there? She got on her black tam. And also give a hand to our, um, the conference vice chair and sergeant at arms, Larry Adams. <laughs> I know I'm gonna get the hook this morning, but I'm very glad to be here. And of course, to share the, just to sit up here even for a minute with our great speakers for today committed fighters in the struggle for justice, both domestically and internationally. Glenn Ford of the Black Agenda Report. <laughs> who is no stranger to the People's Organization for Progress 
and we even hang out a little bit together every now and then. And of course, someone that's known uh, throughout this country and internationally, and we hear regularly on uh, radio stations like WBAI, the great writer and activist Chris Hedges. Give him a big hand. I told uh, Chris earlier, uh, I had never met him, so I, I was sitting right, he would stand up, I was sitting right there, I didn't even know it was him. But his name precedes him about, I don't know, about five years ago for my birthday, my daughter, my middle daughter, Nia, gave me a copy of his book, The Death of the Liberal Class. And uh, how many of you have read that? Yes, it's, it's an excellent work. As uh, Vice Chairman Adams pointed out, uh, we're here today, uh, this conference on the fight for jobs, peace, equality, and justice grows out of the campaign that many of you in here participated in and many of your organizations endorsed. And that was the campaign for jobs, peace, equality, and justice uh, that went for 381 days. Uh, we started uh, that campaign uh, uh, a year ago, and we concluded it. We actually officially concluded it. Uh, I believe it was July the 11th that marked the 381st day. And then the next day was the anniversary of the Newark Rebellion, and we marched anyway on that day as we do every year. And then we decided, well, let's keep going. So the campaign for 381 days actually went, as Doug was trying to point out earlier, for almost 500 days. We actually continued that campaign until uh, the election, election day of uh, last November. And during that campaign, we had basic demands, which I'm sure will come up today. We wanted an end to the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan and the redirection of the money being spent for war toward domestic needs. We wanted a national jobs program to put the 26 million unemployed and underemployed back to work with jobs at a living wage. We wanted an increase in the minimum wage. We demanded a moratorium on home foreclosures, a national system of universal health care, Medicare for all. We demanded to protect workers' rights, as you know, which have come under attack the last few years. We demanded affordable college education for all and an end to student debt. We demanded the rich pay their fair share of corporate taxes, an end to the attack on voting rights and women's rights. And so today's conference, we hope to expand on these demands and create a people's agenda that can actually lead the movement that we need, and I hope people will talk not only about the programmatic demands that we need, the reforms that we need, but I also hope that people will talk about how do we build the movement? How do we put this thing on the road to power? How do we go from being uh, small groups well-intentioned to big groups well-intentioned who have the power to, in fact, bring about the kind of change that we want? So thank you very much, brothers and sisters. Power to the people. Damn, my chairman is disciplined. <laughs> Got it in there anyway. Um, Barbara started it, which is, you know, it's early, and she came with the spirit to wake us up. And so we're going to do one brief thing to continue that process. In all of your folders, you have a copy of the language of the lyrics. Come on up here, sister. Sit. You're supposed to be up here. You have the words to solidarity forever and hope that we could join in a group sing led by our lawyer, Bennett Zorowski, who is also our troubadour. So, if everybody knows, probably solidarity forever comes out of the trade union movement, struggle for workers' rights. But we're not just trade unionists. We're coming from various movements that have a common interest, and that's we have a common enemy. So that where it says, when the union, for example, when the union's inspiration, we want you to say when our unity is inspiration. 
And where the, look, the, the, the lyrics say union, say our unity. Don't just say unity. When unity is inspiration. When unity is inspiration. Fine. <laughs> that way it'll scan. And we're going to do the first, the chorus, the then second. The, no, no. Fifth, fifth, first, fifth, and sixth. First, fifth, and sixth verses. Verse, Follow Bennett's they, lead. They have taken untold millions is the verse we do, and in our hands is placed the power. The first verse, then, they have taken untold millions. And Let's hit it. <laughs> and this is for everybody. <laughs> yeah, it's also good to stand. We, we, we call this Come on, wake up. Let's get it started. Unity. Unity. Unity is right. inspiration. Instead of the union, unity. First. And please stand because it's the national anthem as far as we're concerned. <laughs> When, when unity's inspiration through the workers' blood shall run, there can be no power greater anywhere beneath the sun. Yet what force on earth is weaker than the feeble strength of one? Our unity makes us strong. Solidarity forever. Solidarity forever. Solidarity forever. Solidarity forever, our unity makes us strong. They have taken untold millions from their never toil to earn, but without our brain and muscle, not a single wheel can turn. We can break their haughty power, gain our freedom when we learn that unity makes us strong. Gold, greater than the might of armies magnified a thousandfold. We can bring to birth a new world from the ashes of the old. For unity makes us strong. Solidarity forever. Solidarity forever. Solidarity forever. My pleasure to introduce the panel of our keynoters. We gave them the task of give us an analysis of the society, help us connect the dots, take us out of our individual movements and concentrations, and let us see the big picture. Inspire us and educate us. My pleasure to introduce Chris Hedges. Chairman already did most of it. 57-year-old anti-imperialist journalist. Speaking on American politics and society, has written 11 books, taught at Princeton, Columbia, NYU, University of Toronto, but he's no ivory tower academic because he was arrested with, what do you call it? Occupy. Occupy. <laughs> because he was arrested with Occupy. So what we have is a fighting intellectual who's going to bring us some insight and inspiration. Give Chris a warm hand. But some, he talked about his books. And you can Google them and get the details. We're trying to pick up some time. Thanks, Chris, for being with us. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Uh, uh, I suppose uh, the good news is that the capitalist order is collapsing. Uh, the bad news is that they know it. Uh, and they are preparing every way possible to make sure that when it goes down, we are in chains. Uh, that's uh, what has been uh, undertaken by the administration of Barack Obama, who has carried out a far more egregious assault on civil liberties 
than his predecessor, George W. Bush. Uh, that includes uh, the radical interpretation of the 2001 Authorization to Use Military Force Act as uh, giving, in their eyes, the executive branch the right to assassinate American citizens. That includes the FISA Amendment Act, which retroactively makes legal what under our Constitution was once illegal, the warrantless wiretapping, monitoring, and eavesdropping of uh, nearly all Americans we now know because of Edward Snowden's revelations, and the storage of our personal information, all of it, uh, in perpetuity in supercomputers in places like Utah. Uh, as a journalist uh, like Glenn, I am especially distressed over the misuse of the Espionage Act passed in 1917 by Woodrow Wilson, the equivalent of our Foreign Secrets Act, an act designed to prosecute people who allegedly gave information to those who were defined by the state as the enemy, is now used against whistleblowers, people within the systems of power who have a conscience and who seek to make public uh, the malfeasance, criminality, and fraud uh, that is carried out within those systems. Seven times the Obama administration has used the Espionage Act, the latest being against Snowden. Uh, that between 1917 and 2009 when Obama took power, uh, that act was only used three times against whistleblowers, the first time against uh, Daniel Ellsberg who leaked the Pentagon Papers. Uh, and as a former investigative reporter for the New York Times, uh, what I have found among my colleagues uh, who still do investigative work is that no one in the government system, certainly within the national security system, will talk to them anymore, even on background. Uh, and that's just the way they want it. Uh, the National Defense Authorization Act, Section 1021, which uh, overturns 150 years of domestic law and permits uh, the U.S. military to seize American citizens, that's called extraordinary rendition, on the streets of American cities, uh, uh, hold them in military facilities uh, indefinitely and strip them of due process, including being able to ship them to our offshore penal colonies in places like Guantanamo or Bagram. Uh, now, as many of you know, uh, I sued Barack Obama uh, in federal court in the Southern District Court of New York. Uh, and, and I won, uh, which I think surprised Barack Obama. Um, yeah, I actually sued Baram, Barack Obama and Leon Panetta. Um, and uh, a very courageous judge, Judge Catherine Forrest, issued a ruling which is worth reading, 100, her 117 page opinion, where she talks about it's a kind of, it's, and I think she wrote it quite consciously to be accessible to those of us who don't come out of the legal profession. And she spoke about how. Uh, the separation of powers had just essentially been obliterated. Uh, that when power is concentrated at that level uh, and you allow those authorities to serve as judge, jury, and executioner, uh, there is no check anymore within the system itself. Um, now the reaction of the Obama administration was quite striking. We knew they would appeal, but they didn't just appeal. They went to Judge Forrest Chambers on the day of the ruling, it was a Friday, and they demanded uh, that she put that section back into uh, law, uh, issue, uh, in essence, uh, uh, remove the injunction, uh, uh, put the law back in, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and until the appeal would be heard in the Second Circuit, in the appellate court, which is the court right before the Supreme Court. And Judge Forrest, to her credit, refused. Uh, and so the government attorneys who had been joined, had been, were joined in Judge Forrest Chambers by the attorneys from the Pentagon, and of course they had pleaded national security, went to the appellate court at 9 a.m. on the next Monday morning and it demanded the same thing. You have to put the law back into effect, which unfortunately the appellate court did. And the lawyers and myself had to ask why. Why was it so aggressive? And the only answer that we could come up with is because they're already using the law. Um, that there are probably U.S. Pakistani dual nationals in places like Bagram that are being held by the military without due process in indefinite detention. Uh, because if that law was left to stand and those cases were discovered, the government would be in contempt of court. Um, uh, unfortunately, last July, uh, the appellate court ruled against us. Uh, we are now filing a cert, filing papers, uh, to try and get it into the Supreme Court. Um, but all of this is 
part of the mechanisms uh, that are being cemented into place to essentially shut down dissent. And uh, I would refer you uh, to uh, the book that Larry mentioned, uh, Death of the Liberal Class, because it's a kind of history of what's happened to radical movements. Uh, I began the book in World War I, which was a seminal moment in American history. On the eve of World War I, we had large uh, anarchist, communist, socialist, Eugene V. Debs, of course, polling 6% of the vote in the elections of uh, 1916. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and the robber baron class, and the, the labor wars in the United States were uh, bloodier than the labor wars in any other industrialized country by far. Hundreds of workers killed, thousands injured uh, and wounded. Uh, and, uh, and what happened during the war were two very important uh, developments, legacies that have been left with us. The first was the, uh, which I talk a lot about in the book, is the creation of the first system of modern mass propaganda, uh, the Creel Commission, the Committee for Public Information. Now, this was an important development because you had a, a debate within the Wilson administration. The war had no popularity. Wilson had actually run for uh, re-election uh, in 1916 on the slogan, he kept us out of the war. But with the collapse of the Eastern Front, uh, uh, Wilson began to get pressure from Wall Street uh, because they had lent tremendous sums of money to the British and the French uh, to enter the war if the Germans uh, were able to move, which they were, uh, 51 divisions from uh, the uh, Eastern Front with Tsarist Russia over to the Western Front, then the British and French could be defeated. Uh, and yet, Wilson knew that there was no support at all for the war uh, within the public. Uh, and so they rammed through the Sedition Act and the Espionage Act, uh, but there was a debate, Walter Lippmann, and he, his book Public Opinion is worth reading, it's kind of blueprint for how the ruling elite controls the rest of us, that's where you get the term the process of manufacturing consent, uh, uh, the phrase that Chomsky and Herman pick up when they do their book on the press. Uh, and he says, look, we can use modern mass propaganda to convince the masses uh, to uh, support anything. Um, and they, for the first time, pioneered the understanding of crowd psychology uh, that had been explicated by Sigmund Freud, Trotter, Le Bon, and others, uh, that people are not moved by fact or reason but by the skillful manipulation of emotion. And so the government set in this giant apparatus, its own film division was making in Hollywood movies like the Kaiser, the Butcher of Berlin, its own news division. Every single publication had to print pro-war stories about a bit like today's corporate media. Um, and uh, they had speakers, bureaus, graphics artists, and it worked. Um, so that only the, uh, you know, the most sort of stubbornly independent radicals, people like uh, Randolph Bourne, uh, Emma Goldman, um, Jane uh, Adams, uh, held out. Uh, even W.B. Du Bois sort of caved on us on World War I, right? Do you know, remember? He wanted to be a major uh, in the Army Intelligence. There you go. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, I love, he's certainly one of the great intellectuals and radicals of our time, but on that moment, and when you read Bourne and others, they despair of how even figures like Du Bois are, are sucked in by this propaganda. Well, what happens after the war is that that propaganda machine goes straight to Madison Avenue and starts working on behalf of corporations. But something else very important happens, which Dwight MacDonald, a critic that I admire very much, uh, says we become infected with what he calls the psychosis of permanent war. And he said, none of the political theorists of the 19th century, including Karl Marx, grappled with the idea of the psychosis of permanent war where you're constantly made to be afraid of both internal and external enemies. And it was that mechanism, that psychosis of permanent war that allowed uh, the state, it, it, now in the name of anti-communism, you know, the dreaded Hun during the war instantly becomes the dreaded Red, to destroy our radical movements. Um, Chomsky, I think, does the best analysis of the role of the liberal class, um, which is, is really, I pick up on in the book, it comes from Chomsky, and he says, look, the liberal class was never designed to be the political left. The liberal class was designed as a kind of safety valve to make incremental and piecemeal reform possible within a capitalist democracy. 
So when capitalism collapses uh, in the 1930s, it's the liberal class embodied in figures like Roosevelt and Henry Wallace, Wallace who adjust the system to ameliorate the tremendous suffering of, of the poor and the working class. And as Roosevelt said when asked uh, what his greatest achievement was, he said, my greatest achievement was that I saved capitalism. That's the function of the liberal class. It is to adjust the system to keep capitalism afloat. Now, the myopia of, uh, of the hard right uh, and the business community was, number one, they eviscerated and destroyed the radical movement. So we are actually left, unlike Europe, where there's a, at least been a residue of radical movements. I was invited to speak in Tuscany um, by the Communist Party, which runs Tuscany. Um, I spoke to all of their graduating 10,000 high school students, um, an event which piqued the interest of Homeland Security who held me for an hour at Newark when I returned. Um, they didn't have never tell me, they put me in a room with a bunch of people with forged visas. And, uh, and then finally a supervisor came in and, and said to the person behind the computer, computer tell him on his, he's on a watch, tell him he can go. Um, those without those radical movements, we've lost the very words to describe what's happening to us, which is a vicious class war waged by an oligarchic and corporate elite. Um, and uh, so the radical movements, which had once kept the, um, the, the liberal class honest, were destroyed. Um, I teach in uh, a prison, actually in Rahway now, uh, in East Jersey State, I taught at Wagner before. I guess I shouldn't say where I teach because I'm about to tell you what I do in there. Uh, but I write these sort of absolutely banal course descriptions. The one before last was American history, um, our founding values, the Constitution, uh, you know, how the system of government, the separate, which of course passes the prison. It's the opposite of college, where you try and write a course that entices students, you try and write something that you're trying to get through prison administrators. So as soon as it was approved, I went out and bought uh, every prisoner a copy of Howard Zinn's The People's History of the United States. Now that's a very important book, very important book. It was moving to teach, by the way, because what's so tragic about young African-American men in the prison system is that they've never been taught their own history on purpose. And uh, Zinn understood that all of the correctives to American democracy, and we were essentially established uh, to cement uh, in place a slaveholding aristocratic native elite. As Zinn points out in the book, the wealthiest human being in the United States uh, 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 was George Washington, right, which a lot of people don't know. They don't teach that in school either, do they? And you know how he made his money? He speculated on Indian lands because uh, they knew that when they defeated the British, that dividing line would be gone. So Washington and all his buddies uh, you know, took over all the land and then sold it. Um, <clears throat> so the, the, the system, and you can go back and read the Federalist Papers, they were terrified of direct democracy. So they managed to disenfranchise almost everybody, African Americans, Native Americans, women, uh, people without property, and then create the Electoral College. I worked for Nader, I wrote Nader's speeches for him, uh, and I am really tired of getting into arguments about how Nader gave the election uh, to, to uh, Bush. Um, first of all, uh, Gore won Florida. There's a reason it wasn't recounted. Um, second of all, Gore ran such a s stupid, tepid campaign, he couldn't carry his own state of Tennessee. Uh, uh, and thirdly, he won uh, 500,000 more votes uh, than Bush, but because of the Electoral College, he lost. Um, and that's how they created a system uh, to essentially prevent the rest of us from having a voice. And so Zinn does a wonderful uh, job of chronicling those battles, the abolitionists, uh, the suffragists, uh, the labor movement, and uh, the civil rights movement. Uh, now, I think, the, I think something you in this room get that the American left doesn't get is that it's not our job to take power. It's our job to hold fast to a moral imperative and to create those openings and pressure a liberal class to respond. Um, what's happened is not only have the radical movements been broken, but the liberal class has been disemboweled. And I've taught at places like Princeton, which believe me is just one huge corporation churning out fodder for the 1%, uh, like Harvard as well, where I went to school. 49% uh, of the graduating class goes on to the 
serve Wall Street, and that doesn't count all the people who go to law school and become corporate lawyers. Um, I often sort of uh, uh, am mystified by Obama's complaint that you know we need to work on education, education. The people who got us into this mess are the best educated people in the country. Um, the problem isn't education, the problem's greed. Um, and uh, embodied in figures like Larry Summers. But with the destruction of that liberal class, and we saw it with the McCarthy hearings, thousands upon thousands of artists, writers, directors, teachers, uh, labor activists purged, um, uh, the mechanism broke. Uh, and we, what we have is, is uh, what we've undergone is a kind of corporate coup d'etat in slow motion, and it's over, they've won. Uh, and um, they, in their own myopia, are reconfiguring the country, have largely already succeeded into a kind of neo-feudalism, a world of masters and serfs. Uh, and as they understand that the economic situation becomes more precarious, and let's not forget the effects of climate change, and they've run scenarios at the NSA ad nauseum on this, they uh, need the mechanisms of formal control to keep us in check. Let me just end with the Occupy movement, which I wasn't uh, in, very involved in. And um, indeed, uh, you mentioned I was arrested in front of Goldman Sachs. Cornell West and I held a people's hearing of Goldman Sachs in Zuccotti Park. Um, we brought in uh, mothers who had been evicted from their homes and school teachers who had lost their jobs. And then we marched on Goldman Sachs um, and were arrested in front of Goldman Sachs. Um, the uh, the Occupy movement was lar largely a white, uh, middle-class movement driven by kids uh, who expected to get out, uh, of course, burdened by debt, and uh, find a place for themselves within the system. They got out and found out there was no place. Now, uh, and this is something, again, I, two minutes, I spend a lot of time in deaf liberal class talking about uh, that what we created uh, in, with the death of the liberal class was a faux liberalism embodied in figures like Clinton and Obama, who speak in that traditional feel your pain language and yet betray the very constituency they purport to serve. And the problem with the liberal left is that they followed these people while they betrayed poor people of color. Um, and, you know, police oppression, evictions, Joblessness, it, like that's new in marginal communities. It's new to white middle class kids. And that what is utterly important, and, and as I often said in Occupy, is that we have to go back into these communities which we, as I don't, the white liberal class, betray. And we have to rebuild bridges because with the destruction of the manufacturing base, and I think that's why this movement is important, um, the only way we're going to build a successful movement is bridging what Bakunin used to call day class A intellectuals, Marx used to disparage day class A intellectuals, um, uh, and that, that is the educated elite of the sons and daughters of the middle class who have been disenfranchised with people in this society who have traditionally always been disenfranchised. And that service sector's workers, um, we're not going to, we don't have unions within steel mills, less than 12% of the American workforce is unionized. That is going to be the counterweight to the mass movement um, that hopefully uh, we will build. And let me just conclude by saying that some kind of response is inevitable. That if the state, the state responded to the Occupy movement by eradicating those encampments, if it had responded rationally it would have declared a moratorium on foreclosures and bank repossessions. 30 seconds. A foreclosure on, mor a moratorium on, on, on uh, foreclosures and bank repossessions, a forgiveness of student debt, universal health care for all, not this Obamacare corporate crap, um, and um, a massive job program, especially targeted under the age of 25. But because they did not respond rationally and responded solely in the language of force, something's gonna come. I covered all of the revolutions of Eastern Europe, the two Palestinian uprisings, the street demonstrations that brought down Milosevic. I spent two years writing days of destruction, days of revolt in the poorest pockets of the country, including Camden. The tinder is all there. Um, and so the work in this room is vitally important. Um, the push for the minimum wage is essential. And thank you very much.
Hold your, yeah. hold your questions, please. After all three speakers speak, we'll have a brief quick Q and A and comments, questions. We're going to get here to other speakers, and we're picking up on time. Thank you very much, Jay. Uh, good morning. My name is Jay Arena, part of the committee that helped organize the conference. It's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Melody Chouinard, a student activist from Montreal, Quebec. You know, Chris talked about the, the students at Harvard that, that go to work for the Wall Street and ruling class. Well, our speaker, Melody, not only is on the other side of the northern, the boss's northern border, but is on the other side of that class struggle. She was a key leader, key activist in the powerful student strike uh, for fr a free higher education that was unleashed in 2012. She represented her university, Sharebook University, on the student uh, strike committee. And so we're really happy she made the trek up with her comrades in the audience to join us here in Newark. Give her a round of applause. Are we gonna, is it working? <laughs> We're gonna put up a video. Um, you're gonna see some of the, I mean, some of the protests that, uh, that we did, some of the actions, uh, direct actions that we did during the, the, the student Sorry, movement. The mic's, the mic's not working. Yeah, no, it's not working. Now it's working? Okay. Um, so it's feel working. free to, <laughs> Feel free to watch. Um, you'll see very uh, strong images there. Okay. No, it's okay. Um, so I'm going to be talking about uh, the student strike movement of uh, the Quebec province, just north of here, that happened during uh, the year of 2012. Um, so in 2010, uh, the government led by the Liberal Party announced some privatization measures um, that would affect the, the health sector and also uh, the, the social security and also education. They called it uh, a cultural revolution, which was kind of funny for us. Um, <laughs> they announced a very big tuition hike and uh, from then, the, from then the students started to uh, to organize to uh, to fight against that. Um, from this point, also the student realized that they needed to outreach to other organizations such as community groups, women groups, unions, and tenant rights groups to build a force that would be significant enough and big enough to have an impact on the government's intention to privatize the, these different sectors. They created a coalition that was standing against the tarification and privatization of services. This coalition was named the Red Hand and would be present during the whole student strike movement. Um, from then, the different student association also took mandates to organize direct actions, one day strike and protest. And these, all of these mandates were discussed in, uh, and voted in assemblies following a direct democracy, democracy model. The goal of these mandates was to create an escalation of tactics and build up a sense of ownership to the movement. From the start, the associations wanted to stop the tuition hike, but they were united originally around a free tuition perspective. On November 10, 2011, the student association gathered in Montreal to protest against the tuition hike, giving an ultimatum to the government. The ultimatum was clear. If the government wasn't backing down on the hike, the student would go on an open-ended general strike like they did eight times in the past 50 years. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, this type of strike means that the classes of the different departments that voted a strike were not given. Students would make sure that the strike mandates were respected by blocking access to everyone trying to enter the departments or their classes. And also to make possible such a strike, 
the student associations needed to mobilize their troops and inform them on the specifics and ways to create it. The information plan included the production and distribution of a journal called the Ultimatum, which served to inform and educate the students on the impacts of such a hike, as well as mobilizing them into making small direct actions um, and, for example, one day strike. The goal was evidently to persuade them that eventually a general strike would be required to force the government to back down on its tuition hike plan. In February 2012, the Red Hand Coalition that I talked about before organized a very big action that blocked the stock exchange of Montreal for a full day. This action was significant in giving hope to the students for the strike to come. From then, the general strike was voted in student association assemblies that gathered thousands of people each time. Colleges, colleges and university departments voted one by one for an open-ended general strike. On March 22nd of 2012, the class, which, which was a coalition of 89 student associations, called for a protest in Montreal. At this time, we were 300,000 students on strike, which for us, it's very big, because we're a small population. Um, originally, we have to admit that we did not think it would last as long as it did. Um, so from March, from March 22nd, the students started to organize more locally on their campuses. Some days, Four to five actions were organized concentrating mainly into blocking banks, government buildings, consulates, stakeholder assemblies, bridges, and also strategic routes. Um, and the 22nd of the month became also a general gathering date where hundreds of thousands of people would come to Montreal to protest and march the streets. The government waited more than two months before opening up for negoci negotiations. Um, these negotiations gathered representatives from the student associations and other members of the government. But seeing that the whole thing was more a farce than anything, the protests continued and started to be held at night so the daytime workers could join in. The night protests last more than a hundred consecutive nights. When the negotiations were stopped by the government, it gave another push to the movement that was then even more angry at the government's lack of capacity to go through a real or yeah, real negotiation process. Um, a bit after that, the government voted a special law that was suspending the semester and made picketing illegal. Um, yeah, <laughs> they literally cut the grass under her foot. Um, it was also forcing people to give their itinerary while protesting, um, a protest that would be more than 50 people would be illegal if, if they were not giving the um, itinerary to the police. Um, but, uh, but most of the people wanted to go against this law, um, but if they did, it would result in very big fines. Um, but the class, the coalition of student association, decided to defy it anyway. <coughs> Um, this law was called Law 78, was highly, was highly disapproved by the general population in response, and in response to it, students, families, elders gathered each night smashing on pots and pans um, in Montreal but also in a lot of other municipalities of the province of Quebec. And, um, they gathered each night smashing, smashing, and making the neighborhood shake all over the province. The police force was then unable to apply this new law, even though some protests resulted in mass arrests. Um, yeah, that's sad, but still, we were still protesting. Um, 
at this point, people came into the streets not only to protest against uh, the tuition hike, but mainly against a government that clearly deceived them on so many levels. Even if the protests last until um, the elections that were coming, the law was effective at tearing down uh, the movement. At the end of the summer of 2012, elections were held and the population elected a new government led by the Parti Québécois. Um, this party assured that the tuition hike would be canceled and that the Law 78 would be abolished. They did respect this promise. However, they did not stop several municipalities, uh, including Montreal, to adopt a bill that was a direct copy of Law 78 regarding the protest rights. Um, and after six months in office, the new government passed a new policy raising tuition fees progressively along the household buying power fluctuation. Um, so we did win something. <laughs> um, and I would say it was mainly to, um, to make people realize that they, they could have a power against their government. They could organize uh, and be effective. Um, and from all of what happened, um, we can still look back and, um, and take some conclusions out of that. Um, so the conclusions that we're, able, uh, we're now able to gather after the student strike movement are that um, we always must remain cautious and cynical towards political parties <laughs> and their promises. Um, and it's also very important to create spaces of inclusive political organizations that can gather around a set of demands, like we did with the creation of the Red Hand and uh, the class. Um, and finally, it's very important, uh, important to uh, create lasting organizations with structures that will remain usable for further actions or mobilization, not just for a one-time struggle. Um, the class was created for, the student, for the, the student strike movement, but the different student associations were already used to vote in um, assemblies and were already used to organize in a certain manner to, to do direct action and uh, protest. So it's very important to create a certain structure that will last. Um, so that, were, that was kind of our recommendations. Um, and uh, that was my presentation. Thank you. <laughs> Give the sister a hand. Came all the way from Quebec to share some lessons, to demonstrate to us the power of the people. That's what we saw. Maybe we have lessons to learn and some solidarity to build. Our next presenter is uh, Brother Glenn Ford, the executive editor of Black Agenda Report and a radio commentator, longtime activist in the black freedom struggle, and a strident critic of US imperialism, Barack Obama, and the empire. Please visit Black Agenda Report on your, on, online and contribute so we can keep good institutions alive. Glenn, help us connect the dots, dispel the illusions. Give a brother a warm hand, please. Uh, power to the people. Power to the people. Uh, you have to forgive me. We had our uh, seventh uh, anniversary celebration at uh, Riverside Church in New York uh, last night, uh, and I'm somewhat the worse for wear uh, because of it. So I hope that you will be uh, forgiving uh, of me. Uh, Chris Hedges was, of course, uh, right. Uh, we have not had a movement nationally, a movement uh, in so long uh, that we have lost largely our vocabulary to describe the world and, and how we live in it. So uh, I'm going to uh, concentrate 
uh, this morning uh, on some fundamentals. Uh, we're here at a conference. Uh, we're blessed to have an organization like POP, uh, which, which is actively trying to build a mass and grass grassroots movement uh, here in Newark, New Jersey. Uh, many folks who uh, haven't traveled and live in Newark uh, don't know how lucky they are how, uh, to have an organization that is actually uh, continuing the struggle uh, at this kind of level of activity. It, I think POP is actually unique in the country with 200 plus dues paying members in a middling sized city. There is no organization in New York that can rival those raw numbers. Uh, so uh, y'all got a good thing going with POP. So here we're here at this POP organized conference. And this conference has a set of demands, and that is how it should be. Uh, we all know that power concedes nothing without a demand, and that you are guaranteed to get nothing unless you make a demand. Uh, a conference without demands is a gathering of people who are not serious about politics. We all know that POP is quite serious about politics and it's serious about its demands because it has backed up those demands with many, many, many demonstrations. And if we look at the demands that we're discussing today, uh, we'll see that these are minimal uh, demands and that means that people cannot carry on decent lives with anything less than fulfillment of these minimum demands. Uh, a national jobs program is the only kind of jobs program that will provide people in Newark with any decent jobs at all. Because black people are always last on the list to be hired. And if there is no national jobs program to create jobs, we are not on the list at all. So a national jobs program is not just something out of a wish list. It is a minimal demand. A living wage is a minimal demand because if you can't raise a family and live a decent life while you have a job, what is the point of working? You might as well engage in a life of illegality, which many of us do, and there is a logic to that. So that's a minimal demand, not part of some wish list. Uh, the same thing goes for the other goals of this conference, health care for all and affordable housing and an educational system that actually prepares people to lead a productive life. And that goes for justice and it goes for peace as well. These are the least of things that people uh, should expect and demand out of life. In black America, virtually everybody shares these aspirations. And the truth is, so do most people in white America. The problem is, many of them don't necessarily want these things for you and me as well. But big majorities of Americans consistently poll heavily in favor of all of the minimal demands that you are discussing uh, today. All of the things on this conference's list are not radical, are not fringe, not if one judges it uh, by the public perception of these demands. So why are none of these goals, none of these minimal demands uh, taken seriously when they are in fact so popular with the broad masses of Americans, even down in Tennessee and Georgia. When you ask the question uh, correctly, they're for national health care, and I'm not talking about Obamacare. They're for uh, affordable housing uh, for all as well, just as the people in this room are. It gets more complicated after that. And the reason that these 
popular demands that that commonsensical people all can agree on uh, should, should be expected uh, from uh, in the lives of Americans. The reason that we are not able to achieve any of them is because this system is controlled thoroughly by a small group of people concentrated on Wall Street, uh, what the Occupy movement called the 1%, actually some very small fraction of 1% of the people. And when we say they control the system, that means the Democratic Party as well. That means our black Democratic president. And it most definitely means your new senator-elect, Cory Booker. <laughs> Now, it's not that the Democrats don't think that you and most people are serious about a living wage and about health care and about affordable housing and all the rest. Uh, they certainly know that black people are serious about these issues because black folks are recognized as the most progressive constituency in the country. And all of these items uh, come under the broad heading of the historical black political consensus on social justice uh, and peace. There is no question about where uh, we are regarding those, those issues. And in fact, I just want to uh, digress a little bit. Uh, it, there's a left think tank in San Francisco uh, whose director uh, decided that as a kind of exercise, uh, his group would do a survey, a study, uh, to see where the left lived. Uh, that is, what were the most progressive cities uh, in the country based upon uh, a variety of criteria, including vote, but not uh, exclusively uh, voting. Uh, now this director, uh, uh, a PhD in political science, uh, already thought he knew uh, where those cities were, what those cities were. Uh, he assumed they would be Ann Arbor, Michigan, and Cambridge, Massachusetts, and of course, San Francisco. This is where the left wing of America lives. But he was a social scientist. He wasn't just going to impose his assumptions uh, on the survey. And uh, he went through uh, the uh, social scientific method. And he was quite surprised and shocked uh, to find that the most left cities in the country were not Cambridge and Ann Arbor or even San Francisco. They were Detroit and Washington, D.C., and New Orleans, and Memphis, and Newark. What he discovered was that the m political map of the United States was color-coded. And the, the left lived in those places where black folks were concentrated. That's where the left is. And so when we talk about uh, this historical black political consensus on social justice uh, and peace, uh, we are talking about uh, concentrations of folks in these chocolate cities that actually form uh, the numerical and concentrated effective majorities uh, in, in, in the United States, in those localities. There is no progressive movement in the United States without Detroit and Newark and black Memphis and New Orleans. It does not exist. And this is a social scientist of the left who thought he knew where the left lived. The left lives right here. And so Democrats, I'm talking about the Democratic Party, the Institutional Democratic Party, they are quite aware uh, that black folks are serious in general about uh, these popular uh, demands. Uh, but what they believe is that uh, black folks are not serious enough about these issues to turn on the Democratic Party. And they so far are right. And especially since the advent of the first black president and the near unconditional support 
that black people, where the left lives, that black people have given to this right-wing Democrat, they are sure that they have nothing to worry about, nothing to fear from black folks, and therefore nothing to fear from this broad, general, progressive constituency uh, that supposedly is out there. They know that we care deeply about unity, uh, that the only reason that of people who are 12 or 13 percent and at one point in history were uh, hovering a little below 10 percent of the population uh, could be what we have become on the world stage is because of our unity. So our unity has always been our strength and we pat ourselves on the back uh, about it and uh, curse each other out if we don't see sufficient evidence of unity. But at this point in time, our vaunted unity has turned against us because instead of being united behind these minimal demands on jobs and housing and peace and justice, we are united in support of Obama no matter what he does. And that has turned against us. Black Democratic officials are sure about their ability to trust black folks not to get unified behind these issues that we supposedly care so dearly about. That's why on the issue of peace, which is fundamental and without which we can achieve none of these other goals and demands on terms of jobs and health care and such, on the issue of peace, we have seen a near total collapse in only the last 10 years uh, since you have known a Cory Booker. Let's put it in that kind of space of time. In the last 10 years, an almost total collapse of the Congressional Black Caucus. In 2002, which was just 11 years ago, only four black congresspersons voted uh, for Bush's war powers, permission from Congress uh, to attack Iraq. I remember uh, in Black Commentator, which was the, the predecessor to Black Agenda Report, we called them the four eunuchs of war. Uh, and, and we made fun, and fun of them and vilified them uh, because they were a tiny uh, group. Uh, so we could call out each one of their names and malign them, you see, because it was only about four uh, of them. Just this year, excuse me, in 2011, half of the Congressional Black Caucus voted to continue the bombing of Libya by President Obama. 20 black congressmen. That would have been unthinkable even five years ago. Absolutely unthinkable under a President Bush. But here we had half of the Congressional Black Caucus voting to continue uh, that bombing of an African country. And even as they were holding that vote to continue dropping those bombs, Obama's friends among the rebels, these jihadists who he was uh, arming and financing, were carrying on a race war in Libya, massacring black Libyans by the thousands and sub-Saharan African migrant workers by the thousands. And yet we have half the caucus voting to continue that war. Only 10 years ago, six weeks or so before the invasion of Iraq, the Zogby organization uh, did a survey to see uh, who was in favor of the invasion that everybody knew was coming uh, and who was not. A, a huge majority of white men were in favor of the invasion, about 70%. A small, uh, slim majority of white women were, uh, and nearly half of Hispanics were. 21% of blacks favored uh, the invasion. That's only one out of five. But when Zogby asked the question, would you favor an invasion of Iraq if it resulted in the death of thousands of Iraqi civilians, only 7% 
of African Americans said yes. That's a marginal number. That basically says that almost unanimously, uh, under those conditions, where civilians would be killed in large numbers, black folks were against that war. That is in line with our historical black political consensus on social justice and peace. And yet, nine years later, that does not apply with Libya because we have a black president in office. Our vaunted unity violated our fundamental principles. It worked against us and worked against the Libyan people and worked against the cause of world peace. We became a danger, a danger to world peace. Who believed, who would have believed 10 years ago that black America would, rep would represent a danger to world peace? In early September, when Barack Obama uh, was certain, it seemed, uh, to carry out an attack against Syria. Uh, the ABC Washington Post poll uncovered a statistic that is historical. For the first time in history, the first time in history, more black people supported war than white people in the United States. It was a minority, but a very significant minority. 40% of black folks said that they favored uh, a strike against Syria. 38% of white people, 31% of Hispanics. We have seen, with the advent of this black president, an effective collapse of the historical black political consensus. Uh, Chris uh, was educating us uh, about the National Security Agency and all of their machinations. Uh, only a few weeks ago, I think maybe six weeks ago, uh, there was a vote uh, on a measure that would have defunded uh, at least one of the NSA's programs to spy on all Americans. One third of the Congressional Black Caucus voted to keep the NSA's spying funded. Why? Because our black commander in chief uh, wants us to do that. And, and, and understand what, what this means. Mass black incarceration, which has led to a situation in which one out of every eight prisoners on planet Earth is an African American. That process begins with the hyper surveillance of black America. Black folks and white folks do drugs in about equal measure, but black folks go to jail for drugs in many multiples and many, many multiples of uh, proportions uh, than white people do. That is because of hyper surveillance of black America. If you look for a crime, you're going to find crime. And they look for a crime in, in our communities, and they haul us out of those communities because of that hyper surveillance. And yet you see a black caucus, one third of which supports not just the kind of hyper surveillance that we see on the streets from police, uh, but the high tech kind of surveillance. So we see in, the, in terms of social uh, justice, that social security, which George Bush tried to privatize uh, and was roundly defeated, defeated so badly that the Republicans by 2008 weren't even, even saying the word social security. They got burned so badly that they were afraid that the party had crippled itself by attacking social security. And what is the first thing out of Barack Obama's mouth before he even takes the oath of office? He goes before the editorial boards of the Washington Post and the New York Times, the most influential uh, media in the country, just so everybody would get his meaning, and says that all entitlements, and very specifically Social Security, are on the table. And it did not diminish 
uh, his popularity in black America one percentage point because our vaunted unity was not around social justice and social security as part of that social compact. It was around Obama. We have weakened ourselves. Clearly, the only way we escape this place uh, between a rock and a hard place uh, is by independent political action. Uh, that is, by breaking with the Democratic Party. But that means an internal struggle in black America because we have what we at Black Agenda Report call a black misleadership class that is intent on pushing forward its own interests and thinks, as Michael Eric Dyson said when I had a debate with him on democracy now, uh, that it's all a game and you've got to get in the game uh, in order to play. And that, that clearly showed the kind of mentality uh, that exists in our community among that class that disproportionately occupies uh, uh, positions of, of, of influence. If, if you think of this as a game uh, in which you're always maneuvering for positions of advantage, then you really don't have any minimum demands. You have no demands at all. You're just moving the little pieces around the board uh, to see who wins. But the people never win. I thank you for your indulgence. Power to the people. Power to the people. Folks, we have a few minutes for Q&A. So if the panelists can come on back up front. Chris has to leave, so if you have questions, let's direct get the, quick, the, the questions into Chris first, because he has another appointment to keep. Chris, you come over here? Let's get a seat. Those mics are on, are they not? Yes, yes, yes. Yes, uh, yes, yes. One, two. Eric, were you up? No? Three. Okay, one, two, three. For Chris, go. Yeah. Richard? Hi, my name is Richard. I'm, with, um, I'm a Walmart union organizer. I have two questions. Um, one, I'm all for what these reforms are about in this conference. But what I am concerned is about, are we truly committed to making reform permanent? And making reform, making reform permanent involves taking away the ability of the capitalists to overcome these reforms. That we are not going to see 50 years from now that we have fixed capitalism for another 50 years. The second question is on a more personal level. I am part of the most repressed minority that exists, okay, I'm sorry, on the planet, more than blacks or gays or anybody else. These are the Marxist Leninists. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> we have been in the closet for about 50 years. We have been red baited. We have been isolated. We have been blamed for many of the stuff that we've been red baited into. You know, our little sex, our little cults. But why are we in the closet? It's because our hands are not open to us. We have been fighting on your side for decades now. Not always successfully, not always honestly, but we have been on your side. And uh, are we prepared to let us out of the closet? Is the hand extended out to us? Because we are with your community. I have been with you for over 30 years now, okay, in different countries. So, okay, well let's, uh, it's a moot point as to whether uh, capitalism can be salvaged. Uh, we have reached a point uh, 500 years of uh, plunder, which began with the Spanish conquest, which created the Industrial Revolution, which gave to those countries who uh, uh, managed to carry out the Industrial Revolution the most effective weapons on the planet, industrial weapons, which made them the most efficient killers on the planet, which created empire. The game's up. Um, we cannot keep exploiting both the ecosystem uh, and human beings uh, in the way that we once did. We can't continue to live uh, at a level of consumption. Uh, we can't continue to have an economy run on fossil fuels. Uh, I mean, I guess we can, but it means we're all going to go extinct. And uh, so uh, the difference between now and the 60s is that 60s radicals, essentially because of the economic prosperity of the country, were bought off, in essence. And those that weren't bought off, uh, especially the black radicals like Ogeri Lotulo, 
uh, ended up not only in prison but in isolation where they couldn't speak a truth about the system to any of the other prisoners in the prison. That's why Ojeri spent 22 years, but not just Ojeri, uh, Mumia Abu Jamal, there's a long list of political prisoners in this country. So uh, the system isn't going to resurrect itself, and the system knows it. Uh, and so the, we have to begin to establish radically other ways to relate not only to the ecosystem but to each other if we are going to survive as finally as a species. But of course the corporate state is not doing that. The corporate state is unfettered, unre unregulated capitalism as Karl Marx understood is a revolutionary force in the sense that it commodifies everything. Human beings become commodities, the natural world becomes a commodity that it then exploits until exhaustion or collapse. Uh, and built within that system, as Marx also understood, is a process of self-annihilation because it has no limits. Um, and so really what's happened with this corporate coup d'etat, which is global, this gr and, and workers here in Newark are now told that they have to be competitive in a global marketplace, which in essence means being competitive with prison labor in China and sweatshop workers in Bangladesh who make 22 cents an hour. What's happened with this system is that um, it is, it, it has no internal limits. It ha we can't control it. The governments can't control it. They're anemic in the face of it. Uh, mass organizations like unions have been broken, uh, and we have to rebuild mass movements um, that not only confront corporate capitalism, which quite literally is going to kill us and kill our children and kill the planet, um, but uh, at the same time, we have to begin to think of new ways of relating to each other and new ways of relating to the environment if we want to survive. And the time is not in the distant future. The time is now. You can just look at the summer Arctic sea ice or the recent study by the University of Honolulu on the oceans or uh, various other climate change reports. Yeah. I, I guess I'm looking for some words of wisdom from, well, for Chris and Melody. Uh, we are, some of us were involved in the anti-globalization movement, uh, direct, in, involved in a lot of direct action, also in the Occupy movement. Uh, we've got a history in this country. We saw what happened in the civil rights movement with civil disobedience and how successful that was. We looked to Canada and the inspiration we just saw this morning in that film and we can look to you know, Central Amer our sisters and brothers in Central America and South America and around the world where they are rising up and using direct action. And some of us you know, are kind of frustrated because we're ready and how do we um, get other people over the fear factor? I mean, we have to, how do we prepare people to face the tear gas? And you know, because it's inevitable and that's my question. Right, I've got to go, so I'll give my answer, and I'll pass it to Melanie. The failure, I think, and what, and I, and I will, you know, let you comment on the Quebec movement. But I think uh, by essentially allowing the capitalist state to funnel your energies back into the electoral system, you're defanged. We saw this in Wisconsin, Madison. Their d decision, which I think was the incorrect one, to go for recall, essentially allowed. Uh, largely corrupt and complicit labor unions and the Democratic Party to offer up, you know, uh, uh, a kind of retread of an old Democratic candidate who never spoke to the real issues. Uh, they put their energy into it. What happens? You're buried with Koch brother money and everything else and Walker's back in power. Um, the failure, I think, was that the, the, could have, the other direction was to start carrying out general strikes, which they had the capacity to do and which they should have done. It's extremely important, Karl Popper writes about this in The Open Society and His Enemies. He says, the, the question is not how do you get good people to rule. That's the wrong question. Most people, Popper writes, who are attracted to power are at best mediocre uh, or venal. The question is how do you make those in power frightened of you? And there's a moment in Kissinger's memoirs, do not buy the book, where <laughs> it's 1971, there are tens of thousands of anti-war demonstrators surrounding the White House. Book, uh, Nixon has taken empty city buses and put them end to end around the White House as a barricade. And he's looking through the window and he's going, Henry, Henry, they're going to break through the barricades and get us. And that is where we want people in power to be. Yeah, yeah.
Thank you very much. I'm gonna get I'm gonna get my membership form on the way out. I know, bro. Okay. Remember we both two minutes, we gotta move on. So oh I'm sorry. Melody, you want had a comment? Um, so, about the question of how to uh, convince people to put their, their bodies at risk uh, in doing direct actions or striking, um, I would say from my experience, and maybe my, my comrades will be able to, to help me on that later, but um, I think that we really have to educate people in different uh, workshops and discussions on for example, how to stay safe in a direct action um, or uh, a protest. Um, we were doing that. Uh, you had different workshops that were explaining to people how to, um, for example, move in a direct action, how to stay safe. Um, also, for example, um, when we were organizing an action, we would always tell the people if it was, for example, a a uh, green direct action, a yellow or a red one, mm -hmm. which meant that um, if it was red, you would probably get arrested. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so I think it was very important to always uh, educate the people um, on what was, a, what was at risk for them, but also on just how to move around, um, how to always uh, take care of your comrades. And so I, I really think that just to educate them on, on that level is really important. I don't know if you guys want to add something. I'll do this as fast as possible. My name is Philippe. I was uh, in Quebec, uh, executive of the class during the strike. Uh, the best way, well, yeah. I have an example for you about how to convince people and how to bring them to, to go in direct actions. We, every year for the past 25 years in Quebec, there has been one uh, demonstration against police brutality, the 15th of March. And um, when the class in itself, with its 89 student association members of it, uh, wanted to go for and, and have a position saying, we will participate to this march and call everyone to participate, people said no. And then, after a few protests, after a few times that we got involved and that poli and people were victims of police brutality, and we made that vote again, then they appropriated this demonstration and said, yes, we will participate to it. Because what is important is not to come from the top and say, there are some issues that are important for you. What's important is to bring people to adopt these uh, the revendication being it tuition, uh, free tuition or jobs for all or any other thing. It's just you go to the people, you make them have some assemblies and they vote this revendication and then you bring it out. And when they bring it out, it's their revendication bring their demands, their own thing that they bring out and then they are ready to fight for it. They're, they will not be ready to fight for you or you individually as leaders. They will fight for their own demands. So it's how we we brought it out, and all the associations voted their own demands, and we brought it out for the government. And it's when the government said no to these demands that the people would go out in the streets. Uh, so, like, it's a long process. It took us two years. Mm -hmm. So, like, you need to take the time sometimes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, brother. So, I, I'll try to be quick. My name is Rob Robinson. I'm with the Take Back the Land Leadership Committee. And I wanted to make a statement to Chris, but he left. And Chris, uh, in his talk, said, uh, the tenders for a revolution are there. Mm -hmm. In my opinion, the tenders were dropped and flamed across this, spread across this country when our bank, when our government took our tax money and bailed out banks. And we didn't rise up. We sat state, we sat in our places, we didn't react. So I'm challenging the American people when they're gonna react, and I think part of the problem is and in response to what the gentleman from Quebec just said, we're selfish in this country. When we start thinking in terms of human rights, values and principles, and value community, things will start to change. The term affordable housing can be tricky. Um, affordable for whom? And, and what is affordable? 
So I think we need to get away from that because affordable feeds into a capitalist mentality of greed, right? We need to stay away from that. To Mr. Ford, I so much agree with you about the Democratic Party. It is problematic. When we think about housing, a social, our true social safety net for housing in this country was public housing. Keith Ellison, the first Muslim elected to Congress from Minnesota, put through a bill called PETRA, Preservation, Enhancement, and Transforming Rental Assistance, which would take that private property, that public property, and expose it to the private market. And Keith Ellison put his name on it. In 2010, at the Congressional Black Caucus, we got into a room with him and the, the chairman of HUD and started asking him why he did it. And he put his hands in his head and didn't have an answer. He sold out his people. So we need to start walking around with that badge of the Democratic Party on our chest. More power to the folks in Montreal. The only social change that has ever come about in this country has come from direct action and taking it to the streets. So as long as we sit here, nothing is going to change. Mr. Ford, no disrespect, we can have a list of demands all we want, but demands ain't going to change anything. The only truth is 99% of us and 1% of them, seems like simple math to me, overthrown. <laughs> Keith Ellison did that, uh, signed that bill because President Obama asked him to. Uh, Obama's uh, position on public housing is that it should be turned over uh, discreetly. Uh, under the table uh, to private uh, parties, and basically that means the banks. In New York, uh, there is a pilot program, a federal, of course, pilot program initiated by Obama uh, that would uh, turn over uh, in a kind of receivership uh, all of public housing to, guess who? Citibank. That is the future as far as the uh, Obama administration envisions public housing. Uh, the feds have not uh, been funding the maintenance of public housing, therefore it is in uh, disrepair. Uh, nationally, it is, a, it is by design that, that they do not maintain it so that then it can be declared some kind of blight in need of a takeover by private parties uh, who can do a better job than the federal government has done uh, by, by design. And, and, and that the recipients would be uh, the banking sector. Uh, of course, uh, uh, corporate, excuse me, finance capital, uh, which is a class that creates nothing, only reproduces uh, itself uh, by financial manipulation uh, and by the seizure of the public sphere and anything else it can get its uh, hands on. That is the root of the uh, attempt to privatize public education and public housing is just part of that whole scenario. Thank you. Um, three people, five people who are in queue right now. We have to cut off the Q&A because we've got to get, we've got to move forward. So those five, that brother, this brother, that brother, this sister, that brother, that's it on the Q&A. We've got to, we'll, you, we'll have to find another way to bring forward what your comments and interests are. We'll have those opportunities and discussions around the people to fight back agenda, the demands, and more importantly, even, or as importantly, is the struggle for implementation. Go ahead, bro. Yes, and if anybody can cut it to one minute, please do so, because we're like, yeah. we're like uh, 20 minutes behind schedule. We can shorten lunch. <laughs> we already did. We already did. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Nanda. I'm, I'm from Baltimore. Uh, my question is for, uh, thank you. Uh, my question is for uh, Brother Glenn. Uh, I'm working with an organization called the Ujima People's Progress Organizing Committee, trying to build an independent party in, in Maryland, the electoral party. Uh, and I'm distressed by uh, the, the, the fact that African people have historically been a, a progressive community and had a lot of solidarity with people who struggled, uh, not only in this country but throughout the world, is being uh, essentially silenced because of our unity uh, with Barack Obama. You spoke about the misleadership class. I wanted to, to, to really ask you, this question of class in our community uh, and the struggle against uh, the, the misleadership class, which is uh, elements of the, of the middle class, how do you see that taking place uh, effectively, not only on the national level, but on the local level? Because as you know, in Baltimore, D.C., we're run by uh, black Democrats who implement some of the worst policies against our children, uh, ed education, closing recreation centers down, increasing prisons and arrests. These are being done by black Democrats. 
uh, and there's really no struggle being made against them, uh, or, you know, nationally uh, around this question. Thank you. In terms of that class, you know, in the past, uh, certainly before, uh, prior to uh, our great uh, movement of the 60s, uh, this, this misleadership class was aspirational rather than uh, one that could be measured in, in, in terms of its actual uh, financial worth. That is, uh, the strivers uh, who aspired uh, to be a cut above, uh, and that's the way they actually thought about it, a cut above uh, the rest of us. Uh, with our uh, movement in the 60s, uh, vast new opportunities opened up for those who could take advantage of them. And so it is in the early 70s that we see an actual uh, measurable uh, class of black folks. Uh, emerge because of these new opportunities uh, that they could now enter the corporate world uh, and uh, become uh, the the leaders of the chocolate cities uh, who then were in positions to make deals with the real uh, rulers of the cities which of course are, uh, are the businessmen the white businessmen and so we we then saw the actual formation of classes uh, that could interact with the real ruling class. So when we say the misleadership class, it's it's kind of funny. And in, in one in in one sense, we mean those uh, who would be if they could uh, as close to power as possible, and a much smaller group of people who actually are uh, close to power. Uh, because be, because of their financial situation or their political uh, uh, position, uh, this the the latter uh, to become part of this uh, black overclass is the Democratic Party. That is the vehicle that they ride. That's what makes the Democratic Party so pernic pernic pernicious. Uh, and so when, when I talk about the Democratic Party and I, and I don't talk about the Republican Party, people say, well, why, well, are you a Republican? You know, why are you leaving out the Republicans? Well, we're not in there. So I'm not worried about the effect that Republicanism is going to have on, on black folks. Black folks inhabit the Democratic Party. And to the extent that we are corrupt and facilitate uh, our, our own uh, marginalization, we need to be looking at the connections to the Democratic Party. Uh, one more thing. Uh, it is the, the financial class, Wall Street, has for generations been to the Democratic Party in terms of donations. What big energy, big oil, has been for generations to the Republican Party. That has to be understood. And if the enemy of the people of the world, of human beings as a species, uh, is finance capital, the thing that, that US uh, uh, armaments are actually designed uh, to protect, if that is the enemy of the world's people, then you will find its deepest influence in the Democratic Party. In the interest of expediting and at the same time allowing participation, give me all the questions and then let the panelists respond. Eric, you first. I have two brief questions for Melody. First of all, could you elaborate a bit on what you mean by direct democracy um, in the General Assembly? Who is in the General Assembly? How are decisions made? And second of all, why did you pick the demand free education rather than the demand to simply roll back the tuition increase. Doug? Okay. I got a question for Melody. There's hate speech in, in Canada. Why is it that there's not hate speech in the USA? There's hate speech is against the law in Canada. Why is it not against the law in the USA? It is. It is. I'm radical women of social feminist group. I just want to say about the independent uh, left party, I think Newark is a place where it could happen. When Cory Booker only gets 73 votes in the South Ward during the primary, there's no uh, place for Democrats in this city. I think it's time to launch an independent left party. 
And I think you can only do that by doing it in the street and also through the electoral process. Um, you know, I also would encourage folks to sign the petition for Marissa Alexander and to endorse her case. There's petitions at the Radical Women Table and also petitions for Lynn Stewart. Thank you. Benny. Yeah, I, I just want to put in what might be an unpopular push for at least using the electoral process in New Jersey this November 5th. <laughs> uh, number one, the minimum wage is on the ballot. Question two, it's very important to vote yes. It will raise the minimum wage in dollar in the state, mm -hmm. and it will be an index minimum wage, so it will go up with inflation. Number two, Barbara Bono, is not being supported by the Democratic establishment, and she's being opposed by the Republican establishment. She's on the Democratic ticket, but the fact is that the Democrats are not supporting her in a real way in this state. You haven't seen the Democratic politicians, including Obama, come into this state to support her like they came in for Cory Booker. She doesn't have the money to put up lawn signs and have buttons. She is an anti-democratic establishment candidate. Uh, she became the candidate because all the Christie crats decided they did not want to oppose Governor Christie. The people who sold out, they had thrown her out of her leadership position in the Senate. And then when she said she was going to run against that democratic establishment, she got the nomination. Now, I'm not saying she's not going to prove to, that if she wins, she won't prove to be disappointed to us. But I am saying she'll be a hell of a lot better than we have with Chris Christie right now. And we'll be sending a message if she can get the people to vote for her, because nobody's pushing for her, really, in the cardboard establishment. So i just like to put in that pitch. Thank you, Betty. Camp panelists, you want to respond to the questions that were asked? Melody, specific questions to you. Uh, Elaborating on, elaborate on direct democracy in the General Assemblies and why the demand for free education. free education as opposed to just rolling back the increase. What about hate speech? That was the particularly pointed question to Melody. Now, some of the questions that were asked were why is there, if there's laws against hate speech in Canada, why are there no laws against hate speech in the United States? Um, as for the question for hate speech, I don't have the answer why here it's, it's, <laughs> um, uh, it's not applied, but um, I wish it was for, for you because it's very it can be very practical uh, for us at times. Um, um, as for the question for uh, how di direct democracy is, uh, is made and how do we organize and uh, make decisions, um, well, I, I have to explain first that, for example, the students' associations were already uh, existent. Um, so how it works is that, um, quickly, is that you, you organize a general assembly with the members of that student association. For universities, it's mainly uh, department student association. Uh, for college, because we have a, a two-year college before university, um, is the normally the full college that that is a me well. Each student of the college is a member of one student association. So how it works is that you call for uh, an assembly, and then. Um, People can bring uh, their their demands or uh, their comments um, and so on, and uh, then it can be discussed. And then, if someone wants to bring uh, a, a proposal for something, it will be voted. Um, how it's voted? It's very simple. It's by a raise of hands, um, and uh, so that that's what we consider as direct democracy. Um, after that, um, I don't know if you guys want to... The votes go, uh, the assemblies vote delegates. Yeah. And the delegates go to national uh, congress. During the strike, it was a weekly national congress for all Quebec. Just to tell you, we calculated yesterday with uh, Eric, but uh, Quebec is as big as the east coast of the United States. So we had people that had to drive well, about 17 hours to get to our congresses, and they would do it each week. Wow. And yeah, some did. 
Nathan. And uh, so, <laughs> and the delegates were not allowed to change position. They had to speak what their assemblies had voted. And when we go to the government to negotiate, uh, I was one of them, uh, one of the negotiators, we could not change our minds. We could not like have a middle range decision. If the government has proposed something, we could not say, yes, this is good, we're going to bring it back. We just could say, okay, this is what you're offering, we're bringing back to the assemblies, and the assemblies will vote it. As a negotiator, I had no power. And this is direct democracies. When the assemblies and the members vote, everything and the people over them are just delegates. Yeah, and also if I may have, uh, Philip said before that um, it, it's a very long process to, to organize. Um, and, and people were often, um, I mean, the media, for example, was, was really criticizing uh, our way of functioning. Because they were saying it was, very, um, uh, it was very long, and that, for example, when they were asking a question to one of the spoke people, they, uh, and they couldn't answer because it, it was never voted in an assembly, they were angry and they, you know, uh, they were criticizing uh, very harshly our, our way of functioning. But you guys have to understand that this kind of organization is very important for the people to feel as, as they are fully part of the movement. Because if they see a spokesperson that doesn't say the same thing that they voted in an assembly, they will not feel as part of the movement and they will stop um, fighting. So that's very important to go through that. Yes, it's a very long process, but it's very important to go through that process of direct democracy. Um, the assemblies can last hours and hours, um, as, as, um, as well as the, the Congress with the delegates, it's, it's a very, very long and difficult process. Um, but y you kind of have to go through that for the people to really feel as part of the movement. Um, and also, uh, the other question was um, why we, we asked for free education um, instead of just asking uh, to stop the, the tuition hike. Well, the, the reason for that is that the, well, ASSE, which was a, a, an organization of, of different student association in Quebec that created the class, the coalition of the 89 student association, had already that demand um, in, uh, in its program, in its kind of platform, I would say. Um, so they couldn't really change uh, their demand. It, it was already voted in the past years that we would always ask for free education. Um, so we went along with that. And other student association never voted free education. Um, they, they were asking just for the, the hike to, to be uh, abolished. Um, but I would say that after the whole uh, strike movement, a lot of people that at first thought it was only um, it was only required to stop the hike um, changed their mind and demanded free education as well. So it, you know it, it was already part of the of the demands of uh, of a, a large number of student association that we demand we we had to demand free education from the start. So. Thank you. So. Glenn, you want to brief response to any of that? Pick up any of that? Brief. <coughs> Yeah, I'll just briefly put my two cents in about uh, hate speech. Uh, in the early 70s, uh, there was a, uh, a white man named, I believe, J.B. Stoner, and he broadcast uh, a radio program out of Stone Mountain, Georgia, and it was full of racist uh, invective against black people. Uh, so the NAACP uh, put pressure on the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission, uh, to take J.B. Stoner off the air. Uh, and it gained a lot of traction uh, in terms of black public opinion, but I always opposed it because of the way the United States works. Uh, I said that the first person that they will take off the air if there is such a precedent will be Minister Farrakhan, because that's the way the United States uh, does. So I don't want any legislation on hate speech. Uh, they will convict us before uh, they will lay a hand on the real haters.
Thank you. We have a handful of our culture panelists, the people who came up and made interventions and questions. Thank you very much for getting us started. I think we've got a good foot forward connecting the dots.